Welcome back to another episode of Life of Linux on the PlayStation 2. It's Halloween and this episode could get a little scary. Last episode we finally got Debian installed up and running and I mentioned that we will look at some third party peripherals in this episode but we have to go back inside the guts of this PlayStation to sort out some issues and then we will go to the darkest place known to man. Hell. No, the shell. Now I purchased five dead not working consoles and each of them were pretty well priced so that's why I do a little hardware stuff in these videos too. Uh, my plan here is to get them all working again and running different versions of Linux. So here is the F1 fuse and the F2 fuse information outlined on the board here. This particular model is a GH15. Uh, the F1 fuse here protects the Emotion Engine CPU which is uh, indicated on the board here at 5.1 amps. And then the F2 is the secondary fuse in line with F1. So if you blow those, you've done something wrong. And, <laughs> and I know that from experience, but we'll get back to that later. Ideally, uh, three consoles running Black Rhino, Debian, and uh, Gen 2 would be really cool on the PlayStation 2. The uh, rest of the fuses protect different parts of the board here, from controllers to the USB port, so like the 3.35, 8 volt, and 12 volt uh, rails um, are all fused in different places. And you can get this information from the PSX place or PSX scene, I think it used to be called. Let's have a look around the board under the scope here and uh, this particular machine just would, wouldn't run games and wouldn't run Linux and as soon as you tried to do anything it would just turn off and I was curious to see maybe if the power supply had perhaps failed or if this main board had a blown fuse or perhaps something more devious <laughs> and evil was going on and like there's still a really good healthy community of PlayStation 2 users even to this day with a decent amount of recorded history about this awesome console. So while I was cleaning this up I was also reading the PS2 forums and you'll actually find all the information of the fuses, the locations, their values and some really interesting ideas which uh, I'm looking at for another video. And um, as I searched around the board, I began to notice that something had gone wrong here. Maybe a cap had blown or something yuck was spilt uh, on the unit itself. And we needed to clean it up first to determine if this mess was really the culprit um, that we're looking for. And um, while thinking about this, I, I want to use this perhaps as a PS2 web server of some kind. And a game that I wrote in DOS, I want to port over as a TCP chess or knots and crosses game that we can host from this machine and uh, we can actually connect to it from an, another Linux machine or a Windows or a DOS machine even uh, but that's for a later project down the road and it's pretty pretty nasty and sticky so who knows what the stuff is but let's clean this up with some uh, isopropyl and um, we'll just quickly run around the board and just check all these fuses An interesting observation here is how much the main board of the PlayStation 2 changed over time. Uh, originally it started with two main boards and then a power supply and then they kind of went into this one long main board and a power supply and changing the fuse locations and a few small things here and there over time and that was just the fat console and then they had the slim versions which also changed a lot but which was really cool by this time because the PlayStation 2 was already like 10 plus years old and they were still making revisions and updates to a console that they had already you know they'd already superseded this machine and um, it, it was quite amazing and I think Brazil or somewhere in South America didn't get the PlayStation 2 till like 2012 or 15 or somewhere I read initially and uh, you know a lot of things changed um, so those fuses seem fine and let's clean this up and have a look at this power supply so your AC power comes through here through this fuse and then goes through this filtering circuit uh, as we go along here it comes through the rectifying diode so we get to our DC there which is then transformed through this guy and comes out the other side and is sort of flattened out with this cap here and then we'll spit it through this next one and uh, that's where our 12 and 5 volt and 3.3 sort of stuff starts happening and it's all filtered through these caps and makes it all nice and uh, usable for us and then it finally comes out here and goes into the main board so on the right hand side here is like your positive and then uh, your earth or negative is on the other side up here so it's 
pretty much two rails of each go into the main board so we can easily make a um, 12 volt power supply direct from there. You, you could basically plug in a car battery or a lithium ion pack, which I've, I've got both, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a look at that later on in the video. This board here is one of the uh, half size two part boards I was talking about and uh, while it seemed to be working fine, uh, the networking hard drive was not working so I suspected that the 12 volt fuse for the adapter was dead and I swapped that out like I did in one of my earlier videos so you can check that out if you like. Um, I really wonder what the inspiration for this GD13 design was because they changed it pretty quickly and as far as I can tell uh, it was definitely more annoying to pull it apart the first time I encountered one of these like it's just a little bit different to the um, other consoles uh, but I'll get into that in another video as well. Um, bit of a disclaimer for those Linux people out there it's it's been a while since going back to the darkness of a full shell environment so be prepared and like as we look across this board uh, you could probably think to yourself like why bother doing this there's millions of these consoles out there and yeah there is but I've also learned a lot about this machine and how it works uh, over the last year or so um, and it's it's trivial at best running Linux on you know a very underpowered computer by today's standards but you know what the hey it's just for fun and coming back to uh, such an old environment um, you realize how not fun it can be sometimes this program's not installed or you, you don't have access to this and uh, it's just been so long so I attempted to um, create a new user and this is late at night. I recorded a lot of this stuff late at night. Um, so I'm pretty tired at this point. I think this was like 1 a.m. in the morning. And I'm like, add user, command not found. I'm just like, what the hell is going on? I'm bashing my head on the desk. <sighs> just like looking at the screen. And uh, I thought, okay, we'll log out and I'll try and log in. Logging in correct. So I'm like, well, why can't I add this user? the hell's going on? So we're in the 2.6354 kernel, so this is the uh, VM11 version for um, Debian. And uh, I, I logged in as root and f finally remembered that add user is one word. Uh, I woke up, <laughs> had a cup of tea and sort of came back and sat down and went, oh yeah, that's right. And that's that's probably the, the funniest part is you slam your head on the desk because you're like, what the hell? And then you look back at what you're typing and you go, yeah, well, you're an idiot. So that, that's what happens. So this has always been a funny little setup here, like room number, work phone, home phone. <laughs> I mean, who, who even has a home phone these days? Like a landline. But coming coming back to this old uh, shell, you know, it's, it's a bit nostalgic and uh, a little bit rusty on the commands, so uh, you'll have to be patient with me here. But I mean, I, I'm a user of uh, modern Linux these days, I compile code on there, so I'm in the shell here and there sort of thing, and even in Mac, and uh, I even still play with FreeDOS, uh, which is still, you know, a thing. DOS is still a thing. Um, so we'll do some updates, I reckon. We'll go into here, into the sources list. Uh, yep, that's set up correctly to the archive, and I reckon we'll just do a standard update and see where that takes us. I know for a lot of um, Linux users out there that this part of the video is probably not that exciting, you know, just doing updates and stuff, but uh, you'll see why this becomes a bit of a nightmare for me uh, in just a second, but um, this time I actually used this, I don't remember this happening, but it was, it's been a while. So as, as I'm looking at this going, key expired, key expired, the GPG's out, and I thought, oh, how do you do this again? So I had the bright idea of, well, let's just try and download a single app. So let's download Telnet and we'll try and connect to the um, Blinken Lights server that has the Star Wars, the ASCII Star Wars on there. So I was like, yeah, this should, this should uh, install fine. And um, we should be able to do 
anything else after this. If, if it works here, it should be able to get the updates. If not, I'm going to have to change uh, repo that I'm going to take it from. So the archive may not be working, but all the files are there. So I was a bit like, no, I'm sure you can get around the security issues here. And um, so I had to do a little bit of research back into the old key system to try and obtain either a new key or um, disable the security itself. I thought this is cool, look at that. Telnet for the MIPSAL architecture. And like it doesn't really mean much on the face end value of like software or anything like that, but it's it's pretty cool to have uh, such an obscure sort of architecture, you know. Like, what are you doing on Telnet? Well, I'm running it on my uh, MIPS R5 900 CPU. Like, why? Well, you know, why not? <sighs> so, I couldn't connect to it. So I went back into Telnet just to check commands for options and stuff. It's a little bit rusty and... Um, thought, okay, well, I did everything right there, so maybe I have to initialize the connection through. And I even tried the port as well. And uh, it still wouldn't work. And I, I couldn't connect to anything, so I was like, what the hell's going on here, man? I'm obviously connecting to the internet, but it's just not... It's not downloading. Well, it's not uh, connecting to this BBS service. Or any kind of Telnet service. So I did a bit of research into the keys here. And you can see there that they are all expired. So let's uh, let's grab this up and check the entire list. And like a lot of this stuff might be standard for a lot of Linux users, but it's also uh, this video is just to help people that want to try Linux on the PlayStation 2. So these are some of the issues you'll probably run into uh, moving forward. And I found a key online, so I thought, okay, I'll punch this in, and I'm pretty sure this is the right command to add it, but, well, well, no valid open PGP data found. So I thought, all right, what if I can get the key from the actual deb server? So I'll try that. I want to learn to type. And it's already pretty late at this time of night too. I'm supposed to be in bed, like going to work the next day, but. All right, requesting the key. No key found. That's a sad Putin. Okay, so what's my next choice here? Uh, if I can't get one, I could probably try a different uh, repo. So I thought, well, I wouldn't mind doing two things at once. So maybe I can SSH into it and I can do some stuff from my Mac and then I can do some stuff on the actual um, PlayStation as well. Create another user, perhaps log in and, and you know. Uh, but it didn't want to work and then I remembered there's no server installed, you idiot. So I went and played with my Commodore 64, Running off the SD. which has got the STIC and uh, the Wi-Fi module I built for it. The next day I came back with a new plan, fresh sleep, and uh, I thought, well, it, it's out of date, right? So if I change the date, perhaps I can connect to the, the server and, and it'll download. And uh, I actually made a bit of room there, like it worked, but it sort of threw everything out for the dates and everything was in the future and all that sort of stuff, so uh, it got a little bit up, upset. And then, uh, you know, it said, like, we've got to try and force it, so I'll try it again. Yeah, install what? And then I actually, yeah, I tried to actually get it to update and it ran out of memory. And I'm sitting there going, now what? what? the hell? I didn't even notice what was going on. I didn't read this error message properly. Out of memory. 